All right. How are you doing? How are you doing, um, Tristan? I'm very good, thanks. How are you? Ah, uh, good. It's an absolute pleasure to uh, be joining you. So um, I'm Mark from Tabletopia, and I'm here with Tristan Hall, the designer of Veil vale Wraith, which we're going to have a little playthrough of today. Um, but uh, before we get started, Tristan, if you could uh, just tell me a bit about yourself, I'd love to um, find out about you as a designer. Sure. Um, so I've been uh, playing board games since I was a kid, obviously, and um, mm. just generally grew up a geek, doing geek, geeky stuff, role-playing games awesome. and all that kind of stuff. And I uh, really got back into board games in my 20s, a long time ago, and uh, <laughs> started tinkering with other people's games and sort of de developing like variants and scenarios and things like that for other games that I enjoyed and I played. And those kind of, I, I sort yeah. of up uploaded them to board games, even places like that and on my blog and got really good feedback on scenarios that I designed for the Lord of the Rings, the card game, and for the oh, amazing. Dungeons and Dragons adventure system games and stuff like that. And I started coming up with my yeah. own game ideas. And the fact that the scenarios that I was designing for other games were getting like really good feedback, you know, I was getting sort of tens of thousands of downloads and that uh, made mm. me think that maybe I might be able to design my own game. So Of course, yeah. So I gave it a shot and I went down the um, traditional publisher route and my first mm. game bloom of kill for yes and um, got taken on by a publisher and um spent a couple of years on their shelves kind of gathering dust and sure you know, sure yeah it, it didn't really go ahead they were moving towards making more family orientated games rather than yeah. like hobby niche like fantasy rpg type sure. So we had a discussion about it, and they basically said, "We've got your, you know, we've we've signed you up for five years, so yeah, that means we can produce the <laughs> it's game." A good deal. <laughs> it, it meant that they could produce the game at any point within that five years, even with me potentially having to wait five years for it to get published, or, yes, or not course. get published after five years. So we had a chat anyway, and they eventually just released the rights back to me. And at that point, people had told me about this thing called Kickstarter, and the guys who were playtesting the game. Um, suggested that I try and put it on Kickstarter. Mm. So we did that back in 2015, and after, after 27 days of a 30 day campaign, <laughs> it finally funded. Oh, um, amazing! Yeah, so it was kind of an agonizing journey, but it was it was really fun as well. And it was whilst I was working mm. full time, so I'd get home after you know a nine hour shift, and then be yeah. on the internet for like nine hours. Um, yeah. <laughs> running this this Kickstarter campaign, but it was it was brilliant fun, and it took um, because of uh, my naivety and inexperience and the sort of ambition of the game. It took like almost two years after the Kickstarter for us to produce and, and deliver. Um, oh wow! It, yeah, <laughs> it was a bit <laughs> of a long development, uh, but in that time, it kind of gathered um, even more momentum. It got picked up by distribution in the UK and. Mm. Um, it did okay. It, ran, it, well, it did really well. We, it was released to really good reviews, and we sold out within a couple of weeks. Awesome. Um, which was, yeah, fantastic. So That's awesome, I yeah. I chanced my hand at doing another game, um, yep. which was very different. as a historical game about the Battle of Hastings called 1066 Tears to Many Mothers. Yep. Um, and that funded as well. So it sort of... Awesome. Yeah. So it, it kind of led me down this path of, okay, I can do this. And I started creating more games, and um, so now we're on our seventh Kickstarter for this game, which we're about to show you. Oh, well, right. And this yeah. is live on Kickstarter right now, ending in tomorrow. Tomorrow, so within the next. Wow. I think within twenty-four hours. So. But you're yeah. you're already super funded, right? Like this is in the can. <laughs> it's done, yeah, dusted. We're, we're delighted. It's it's. That's amazing. I think our third most successful game now, which for for something that's very kind of niche and um, it's yep. brilliant for us it's, it's and and so your your whole or nothing uh productions which is you and uh francesca my wife yeah so, yeah great yeah so she's the she's the brains behind the operation uh, i design the games and do this side of it and she does all the clever stuff with the accounts and that she's a, a yeah great by day uh, and a, a geek superhero by night oh it's <laughs> but, amazing well, I'm, I'm <laughs> you've got, she, you got a good a super team there <laughs> She also does the music for the games. So yeah, great. Any of our videos that have 
like uh, the gorgeous sort of piano soundtrack at the top. That's her work. So, and she runs oh, that's um, awesome. the social media side of it and um, all that kind of stuff. So, the chances are, if you email our company, you, you will be speaking to either me or, or Francesca. Oh, great. Uh, we're accessing uh, people in the comments who are saying they love Francesca's music. So you're not alone there in, um, in yeah, no, uh, enjoying it and appreciating it. That's brilliant. Tell them thank you. I mean, it's it's great because I get to listen to her music whilst I'm designing games, you know. So yeah. it's she comes up with uh, music based on the themes of the games, and that sort of inspires me to like get into the world of it. So, for example, with Gloomy Killfoss, she wrote an entire soundtrack. Like, uh, it's almost wow. Like, um, uh, symphony like like piano concerto, <laughs> um, which you know it's not essential to play the game, but it just really if you were so inclined, you know, to put that yeah. in the background whilst you're playing the game, it just sort of really helps immerse you in, in the, the themes and uh, give you that sort of greedy kind of four D <laughs> experience yeah. whilst you're playing the game. Hundred uh, percent. You mentioned you meant you mentioned the Killforth game. This is set in the same universe, uh, Valrath. Yeah. So it's. It, it's not compatible with Gloom and Kill for mm -hmm. it's, it's a completely different uh, system and set of mechanics and everything, but yep. it's basically set in, in the same universe. So mm. um, in the sort of the, the backstory that I originally wrote for, for the world of Kill for, um, the world was doomed, basically. It was engulfed in this uh, caustic gloom, which kind of destroyed life and colour and uh, nature and everything that it touched and just mm. left this horrible blanket of darkness across the world. And the idea was that the heroes who play in that world, and, and originally it was a, an RPG campaign setting, and oh, those cool. heroes would be moving from sort of outpost to outpost in this complete, like, terrifying darkness that was filled with... Gloom world, yeah. Gloom, yeah, and demons and monsters and everything. Um, but Gloomy Killforth is more a sort of traditional fantasy adventure experience mm. where you're you play the heroes at the turning of the tide so you actually have the opportunity to prevent that gloom from spreading and destroying the world by yeah. obliterating the creatures that are responsible for it the, these demons from beyond the veil um whereas in veil rave we kind of imagine that you've not succeeded <laughs> and that all yeah, the sure, heroes sure. have perished the world has ended these demons have, have come in and obliterated oh wow yeah all all so life. Is, is, it, is it an alternative uh, version of events that happened, or is it a direct continuation? You, well, you could you could read it either way, you know, depending on how <laughs> you could... And how, on how well your campaign did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how well you did in Gloom and Kill for, you, you know, dictating yeah, yeah. should be playing Bellamy. You could sort of say yeah. that thematically, but basically, yeah, it imagines a world where the heroes have failed and the, the darkness mm. has, has come, but through, like, an incredible sort of narrative twist of fate, you are an entity yep. that's been sent back um, after the destruction of the world to try and right all the wrongs and undo what has been done. And you're the embodiment of the memories of everything that's gone before, the memories of all the, the heroes and the stories and the epic tales that have occurred um, yeah. before the world was obliterated. And as a result of which, you, you play this creature called a Veil Ray, who is sent back into this world to try and find the keys and the memories uh, that made that made everything what it was. You know, I sure, sure. personally have this strong belief about stories and how important they are to us and, and how yep. they, they feed our imagination. And, you know, on a sort of, on a, on a, I, don't, I don't want to sound pretentious, but like when, when we leave this world, what we leave behind is our stories. You know, the stories mm. that your children relate or your grandchildren relate and that kind of thing. And, it's, so, it's, it's how you carry on and how you pass yourself on, right? Exactly, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and history, all of history is, is stories, you know. So um, so the idea, so it's kind of very sort of abstract <laughs> in that respect. Yeah, yeah. That cool. you're using these memories to uh, try and bring life and colour and light back to this sort of blackened, broken world. Um, so against this sort of uh, crazy backdrop, the, the gameplay is actually kind of puzzly um, yep. and quite hopefully quite addictive. And this was my response to sort of wanting to create a game that you could play in, you know, 30 or 40 minutes. If you mm. sit down with Gloomy Killforth or Shadows of Killforth, you're in for a kind of an epic RPG experience. Scrolling, you know? yeah. yeah. 
and you'll have this big adventure and everything. Whereas with Veil Wreck, I want it to be it to be in um, bite-sized chunks that you can enjoy at your leisure. So the idea mm-hmm. being, you can play one game of this on your lunch break, and you know, yep. pack up and you're all done. But it's also linked together with a narrative campaign where the sort of the threats grow bigger and uh, the the difficulty escalates. So if you were so inclined, and as I have done while designing it, you can kind of get lost in it as well. So you could play it for cool. half an hour and, and leave it, yeah. or you could get stuck it in and be sat there playing through the entire sort of campaign, and, and then you know you're looking at a good few hours lost <laughs> in this. Yeah, game. beautiful. Oh, well, that's brilliant. Um, so this is a solo adventure game, um, but it does have a multiplayer option. Um, you need another base copy of the game, is that right? Correct, yes. So it was definitely designed as a, uh, the, the primary sort of idea was that it was a solo game, but as I was designing yep. it, it struck me that the mechanics would easily uh, scale out to mm. multiplayer modes, um, which is kind of how Glimmer Killforth works as well. You can play as one hero, you can play as a team of heroes, or you yep. can play it as multiplayer, com- cooperative or competitive. And because of the nature of these games with the exploration and the abilities and everything, Veil mm. uh, scales out as well. But because cool. of the amount of components that you need for an individual player, each player will yep. need uh, their own copy of the game. So you can play it cooperatively, where you're all working to get through these vignettes mm-hmm. together, or you can play it competitively as like a race game to be the first person to defeat the vignette and, and clear the level. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cool. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> oh, um, cool. sorry, are you still there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, yeah, great. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, just cut off for a second on my end. So, brilliant. Um, let's get stuck into this. Um, so, we've got the game loaded up here on Tabletopia. Uh, what are we looking at? And how does this compare to what the final game would look like? Okay, so this uh, compares... Very well. I mean, the, the artwork and everything is finalized. By the um, way, the artwork is stunning. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's really unique. It was uh, it was designed alongside the artwork that we developed for Shadows of Killforth and some yeah. other future titles. And basically, the idea is, because this is the memories of everything that's destroyed and the colors washed out of it, it was mm. um, it's designed to be sort of a vague impression or, you know, an, an idea of what was. So they're quite sort of esoteric sort of representations of either the creatures that you meet, they, they could be lost souls who are you know stuck mm-hmm. in this bro- broken world, or they could be actual evil um, demons or creatures sent by the evil uh, being that destroyed the world, the arch being. Sure. Yeah. Um, I really, so, um, I really, I really appreciate your commitment to just making the entire Kickstarter page <laughs> black and white. All of your social media, black and white, just sticking to that theme of like gloom and lost memories. It it's was really cool. One of the brilliant things about being an indie, independent designer and independent publisher is that you can get away with, not get away with, but you can try different approaches like this. Like a lot. Of, yep. A lot of early feedback was, you know, I'm not going to buy this game because it's not in colour. And sure. You know, so, so yeah, so it's quite hard to hear. And, and on, on the yeah. one hand, you're sort of like, well, we could just, you know, we have the resources. We could just go and, you know, make a colour version of the game. But it kind of felt, for me, that would be drifting away from what makes it, you, you know, one of the things that makes it unique. And Disingenuous to your vision. Yeah, and, and also... I just think it looks really cool as well. You know, <laughs> I think it's, it's awesome. It's I don't know what people are talking about. And yeah, so the, the the seeds or the germ of this idea have been mulling in my head for years and cool. being able to sort of bring it to life like this and and have it um, uncorrupted, <laughs> you know, like yep. that, be able yep. to create a 100%. It's brilliant. And, and so we put it on Kickstarter and, of course, we... Francesco and I every single time was like, you know, will it fund? You know, what we, you know, have, <laughs> should we have made it color and have this big sort of um, back and forth? I think, I think, you, I think you've done fine. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, it did okay. It funded in an hour, so we were straight away like, okay, it's fine, it's all good. <laughs> you know, awesome. We're, we're on the right track. So yeah, so it is quite yeah. unique yeah. looking. Um, and That's the awesome. So some of the some of the bits and pieces, the tokens and that might change, but the mm. actual uh, the, the main gameplay and the cards and everything are. Uh, pretty much perfect like all right well uh tristan it was uh really good to chat to you i'm gonna leave you to kind of explain the game and um tell people 
how to play the game, and then you're going to play um, a little round yourself. Yeah, well, I'll go through the components and stuff, and then we'll play a few rounds, and you know, uh, people will be able to jump in after this and, and play on Tabletopia yes. themselves, right? It's uh, live on Tabletopia right now, so um, people can check it out there, and uh, people should not forget to check out your Kickstarter. Um, oh, yes. I'll leave you to it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'll see you around. Okay, cheers. Okay, so here we are with there we just get rid of that window capture. So down at the bottom of the screen here, we've got the three actions that you'll be using throughout the game to try and overcome the threats that are going to be coming out of the threat deck. We are looking through this threat deck here for five keys which will allow us to escape this vignette. Uh, vignette is like the name of the level. And here's the particular vignette that we're in. We're in the first one here called Lost Ruins. And at the top of the card here is the composition of the threats that we're going to be facing, along with a foe. Here we've got the Goblin King uh, somewhere in the deck in stack force. That means somewhere towards the bottom of the deck. So we're going to be going through this deck, trying to overcome the, uh, the Deja, which are the Lost Souls, that we'll meet along the way, and the anima, which is kind of like twisted spirits or corrupt demonic entities that we need to defeat to work our way through uh, these threats to find five keys. So the keys are abstract representations of events and memories that will allow us to restore colour and life to the world. And once we've collected five keys, this will allow us to access the portal over here. Uh, which will allow us to leave. And so uh, the goal of the game is to collect the five keys and escape through this portal. And I'll basically just start taking some turns and, and show you how it plays out. Um, here, Down here we've got the action power track. So you have the three actions. We've got explore, fight, and influence. And the number above each of these actions is how powerful that action is. And so I'm going to draw a threat card to show you what we're up against. And pop this into the display here. So at the start of each round, you draw a new threat and you see what you're facing, basically. So I'm going to flip this over. And here we have an enforcer. So this Deja, when played, has a grapple effect where it removes a power token from our fight action. So throughout the game, we can add these tokens over here, these plus one tokens, to each of our actions to help boost them and make them more powerful. Because it's the first turn of the game, we don't have any power tokens in play, so his effect isn't going to hit us this round. Uh, after we've drawn a threat, we get to draw a memory. So we've got a deck here of 20 memories that we're going to use to face the threats that we'll be facing. So we're going to draw one of these into our hand. And here we have the memory of knowledge. So memories, you can play as many of these uh, as you like in one round. So you can either save them up or use them as you get them. And this particular one allows us to swap any two actions on our action power track. So uh, this guy needs influence, four influence to defeat. And we only have three influence. So if we played the memory of knowledge, we could swap a couple of these actions around. But because our influence is in the top spot anyway, it's actually where we need it to be uh, to take him on. But we don't have four. Uh, we only have three at the moment. So the first thing we could do is try and get one of these power tokens and stick it on our influence action. So each round, as well as being able to play as many memories as you like, you're allowed to do one action, uh, which is you would tie a card like this an action card. You turn that sideways to show that you're using that action. In this case, I would generate three points of influence to try and <coughs> defeat this guy. But that's not going to work because he needs four. So we're not going to do that action just yet. And every action card has an alternative utility where you can use the card to draw a memory. So because we're not going to be able to defeat in this turn, I'm just going to use this action. In fact, I'm going to use this action to just show you something. So 
I'm going to use the fight action just to draw a card. So first of all, we turn it sideways to show that we've used the action. But as soon as you use an action, it moves to the bottom of the action power track and it bumps any other track actions along. So we can see like the, the power of the action has now been reduced and the power of the explore action has now been pumped up to two. So that's allowed us to draw a card. We're just going to do that now. And here, okay, shuffling terrible. <laughs> we've got the same card again. So we've got memory of knowledge. So you've got two of each memory to start with in this deck here, and you'll be refining that deck over the course of numerous games throughout the campaign. So we've done our action, and we're not going to be able to attack him. The, the other final thing we can do is we can tilt an action. So in the in the real life game, it would turn the card 45 degrees. I don't think there's a facility to do that on Tabletopia just yet. So I'm just going to rotate this entirely like upside down to show that we're tilting that action. So tilting doesn't mean using, so we're not attacking him with that value. All we're doing is adding a single power token to that action. And what that means is in a future round, we can spend that, that power token to increase this action by one. Okay, I hope that kind of makes sense. We'll go on to the next round. So at the end of the round, uh, this guy's going to hit us for one point of spirit damage. So here's our spirit dial here. And we start with 20 in the solo game, 20 spirit. And if that goes down to zero, we toast, it's game over. So he's hitting us for one, so we're down to 19. And then it's the end of the round. So we're going to reset this and this. And we're going to start a new round with a new threat. So we draw the top threat from here, bring it into the threat area, flip that over, and here we have our first key. So these are the keys that I mentioned earlier that we're looking for. This is the first of five that we're going to need. And we're going to need four explore to be able to gain this key. And it's not a threat, sorry, it's not, it's not doing any damage to us. So we don't have to worry about being hit by it this round like we would with this guy. So uh, we're going to draw our own memory. And now we've got, so we've got these two memories of knowledge that allow us to swap the position of the actions on the action power track. We also have memory of blood, which is going to give us plus two to our fight action. Uh, he doesn't require a fight. He requires influence to overcome. And the key requires explore. So we're just going to bank that for now. You can have up to six cards, six memory cards in your hand at once. Um, and if you have more than six, you need to play them down before the end of the round. Otherwise, you're going to have to discard down. Okay, so we don't have any bonuses to explore. Our explore value here is two, but we're going to need four to be able to take that key. So we're not going to be able to do that just yet. But we have, because we added that power token in the last round, we have now gathered, gathered enough influence to be able to take out this pesky enforcer. So he needs four influence. We have three here because we're under the third spot in the action power track. And we also have one bonus one from this power token here, which I'm going to chuck over here. Whee! Uh, I'm going to rotate this to show that we've used the action. And as always, that goes to the bottom of the track and pushes these two up. So we've generated three plus one is four influence. And this enforcer has four influence. So he is toast. Boom. He's not going to be hurting us this turn. And now we're left with the key. And we need four explore to be able to defeat that key. Uh, we've played our action this round, so we're not going to be able to play another action. Our explore here is in the three spot, so we can tilt. Uh, again, turn this upside down, even though normally you turn it 45 degrees to show it's used. So that's tilted, and we're going to add a power token to that. So now we know next round, we're going to have four explore, which is enough to take the key, but it might not be enough to deal with uh, whatever new threat is coming. So at the end of the round, she's doing us no damage. So we're going to reset and go again. I'll reset that. Reset that. Draw a new threat. Which is a pariah. OK, 
Okay, so this is uh, a Deja, an outcast pariah, who needs three influence. He also has the special ability. If you defeat this pariah, you place it in your discard pile, and if drawn from your discard pile, you just discard the card, and he's doing one spirit damage to us every round. So, even um, if you do defeat him, he's going to go into our memory discard pile down here, and if we run out of memories, we're going to reshuffle the memory deck, which means he'll go into our deck, and if we draw him on our turn, it's a duff card, basically. He's, he's given us damage, almost, because that turn's wasted. And um, so, three influence. Our influence is way down here on a one. We could use Memory of Knowledge now, and that would allow us to swap any two actions on the action power track. So if I play that now, we can put the influence action right up to the top of the track here and swap it with the explore action. But we have enough explore here to claim this key of, of love. So the first thing I'm going to do is claim that key because that's going to give us another special ability which I'll go through with you in a second. So we've got three explore here, plus one from the power token, we need four, so that's just the right amount. So I'm going to use this action, I'm going to spend this token, I'm going to put that down to the bottom of the track, so that generates four explore, and we're going to move these along, and that allows us to claim this key. So we're going to put this down in our play area. Uh, we still have the pariah here, who needs three influence. So, with the key, the keys all have two abilities. One of them we can tilt to use, and the tilt action of the five keys is always to use one additional available action. And after we've tilted it, so say if I use this now, I can now use one of these extra actions. So I could try and use influence to defeat the pariah. He's got three. I only have two at the moment, but if I play Memory of Knowledge, I can swap any two actions on the action power track. So this isn't an optimal move, and I'll talk you through that in a second, but I'm going to play it just to show we can do it. So I'm going to play that, swap these two actions over, and of course now we have three influence, which is enough to defeat him. We've used our key's ability to play an extra action in a round, so we can generate three influence and defeat him as well. And as I said, he'll go not into the threat discard pile, but into our own discard pile. I'm going to keep the key in play because it still has uh, an ability we can use. We can also, so now we've used it for its additional available action. At a later point, we can flip the key over to generate plus one influence. So it's almost like an extra power token. And if we were to do that, that key would then be spent, <coughs> excuse me, and we put it up here next to the portal because we're collecting five keys to try and open that portal. So I'm going to flip that back over. Um, so we've used the influence to defeat the pariah. So our influence is going to go to the bottom of the track and shut these up. And we haven't tilted a card this turn, so I can tilt, fight. Add a power token to it, and there are no threats in the threat area, so we're not going to take any damage this turn, which kind of sounds good when it is, but we've used up our key ability. We've only got five keys in this threat deck, so you're only ever going to be able to use those, those abilities five times, and the threats get nastier as we go down um, and more numerous. And there's also that Goblin King in there, the foe that we need to defeat, that's mentioned on this Vanna vignette here. The Goblin King is somewhere in stack four. And uh, so the, the foes work similarly to the threats, but they'll have multiple threat values to overcome. They might have influence and fight, or fight and explore, or any sort of combination, and the values are higher. Their damage that they output is higher, and their abilities are nastier. So if you use up all your key abilities before they come in, you might find yourself wrong-footed. Um, so we'll play through another few turns just to show you what else can happen. 
and then I'll talk to you a bit about the portal and the archfiend here. Okay, so at the end of the round, there's no threats, we're not taking any damage. So I'm going to reset these cards, the action cards, and we're going to draw a new threat. I'm going to flip that over. And here we have a Hobgoblin. Okay, and this has the Harry ability. When played, shuffle your discard pile into your deck. Okay, he has a low fight here. He's only got two fights, and he's only doing one damage around. But this ability can be quite nasty, because we beat that Pariah before, uh, which meant normally we'd be waiting, we've got 17 cards left in our deck before he comes back around. But now, this guy is making us shuffle our discard pile into our deck. So we're going to have to flip that over, stick it on top of our deck, so it makes a new stack, and then we're going to have to shuffle that stack. Okay, and then we draw a card. And hopefully it's not the, hopefully it's not the Pariah. It's not, okay. So we've got the Memory of Might, which is going to give us an extra one to our fight value. Okay, well we're okay here because this guy has only got two fights. And we're already in the three spot. So we can go ahead and whack him for three. Put this down to the bottom of the track. And defeat this dude before he is able to do any damage. So he's off to the threat scar pound. And we can tilt the card. So, uh, in anticipation of it either being a Deja, maybe that we need to influence, or another key. That we need to explore. I can tilt either of these two, and I'm going to tilt explore because this key is one of the easiest ones to find with a four explore value. There's a key in the threat deck here which requires um, eight explore, so it's going to be the only the only sort of natural way to be able to do that would be to have the explore token sorry, the explore action in the number three spot and have like five power tokens collected on it. Um, obviously, you can get around that by using memories as well to boost it. So, in anticipation of finding that key, I'm going to tilt, explore, and add a power token to it. Again, we've played the area because we're brilliant at this game and there are no threats here. So, I'm going to reset everything, start a new round, draw a new threat. Flip that over, and here we have a fighter. Bruise, when played, remove one power token from your influence action. Okay, well, we dodged a bullet there. You can see we got a power token on our fight action, a power token on our explore action, but nothing on our influence action. So it's been you, fighter. Your ability didn't work. And he's doing uh, one point of damage to us, and he has four fights. Well, because we fought the Hobgoblin last round, who had two fights, our fight has dropped right down to the one spot. Uh, which isn't ideal. Uh, so, he needs four. We've got one from it being in the one spot. We've got one power token here, so we can bump that to two. We have the memory of might here, so we can bump it to three. Or we can just use the memory of blood, which gives us plus two. So, if we play that now, that gives us two, three fight. Plus one from the power token for four. He is off. Boom. Okay, and once again, we've proved how awesome we are by clearing all the threats. So, uh, I can tell either of these, and to hedge my bets, because these guys are targeting different actions, rather than tilt explore and put all my eggs in one basket, I'm going to try tilting influence and add a power token to that. Okay, and then at the end of the round, they're going to reset and draw a new threat. And take the top card here. And here we have a mystic. Okay, so the mystic's mystical ability is played. Reveal threats until you reveal a key. Put it into play. Shuffle and then place the rest back on the threat deck. So. She's actually going to help us in one way, because she's going to get us to the next key faster. 
But on your turn, if in a round you draw a key, it's kind of like a breather because the key is not going to do you any extra damage that round. So in one respect, she's letting you get to that key faster, but in the other way, she's taking that one round of uh, a breather away from you. So we're going to flip that. So we take the top card, and we're just going to keep flipping through here until we find the key. So a healer, that's another key. Ah, key of power. Okay, so she's brought the key of power into play with her. And we're going to shuffle all of these, which is one, and put it back on top of the deck so we know what's coming up next round. It's going to be a healer. And here we have key of power. So we need five explore to be able to get that key. And we need three influence to be able to defeat the mystic, and she's going to be doing us one damage each round until we defeat her. So, do we go for the key first? Five explore, we've got three here, we've got plus one token, so we can bump that to four. We've got extra might, and we've got extra swap any two actions on the action power track. Okay. Uh, so we don't have enough to defeat it yet. Let's see what memory we draw this turn. Okay, and the memory is memory of Veil. Okay, this is going to give us plus two explore. Which is perfect. That's exactly what we needed. Okay, we just had a question through. Uh, what does the shield and the card give at the bottom of the card? Okay, so each card has each memory card has a shield icon here and we're going to do some development on this to make it a bit more obvious we're going to move the icon probably up to here or here and make it more obvious but basically when you hold two cards up in your hand physically um, two they will each have this combined number next to the shield here and all of your basic memories that you start the game with have a combined value of one and what that means is if you're in a situation where you cannot defeat a threat, you don't have enough uh, of influence, fire, explore, uh, but you have a handful of cards, what you can do is combine two cards in your hand to create a power token effectively. So I could, let's see, we've got three explore here, plus one from the explore token, that's going to give us four, and we know we need five to defeat this key of power. So let's pretend for one second we don't have the memory of fail in our hands. We only have memory of might and memory of knowledge. So in a kind of drastic move, what we decide to do is discard both of these to gain one in any value. So in this case, it would be explore. So we discard both of those. No, not on three. <laughs> we discard both of these, the uh, memory of knowledge, and the memory of might, we combine them together to create one extra explore, which will give us exactly what we need to defeat the key of power. Okay, but we were extremely lucky because we actually drew the memory of Bale. So what I'm going to do this turn is grab that key using this memory of Bale. So we'll play the explore action, drop that to the bottom of the track and push these two up. That's giving us three power from here. And we don't even need to spend this power token yet. We can bank that for later. And when you spend power tokens, you don't have to spend all of them that are on there. If I had two power tokens, I could spend just one of them, for example. Uh, but I'm generating three power from the action power track. And I'm going to discard memory fail to bump it up to five. Which is exactly what we need to obtain the key of power. Okay, so I'm going to bring that down here. And now we have this pesky mystic to deal with. So she's doing one damage to us and we need three influence to defeat her. We now, because we've maneuvered the track around, we've got the influence up to the top of the track. That is enough to be able to defeat her. What we have to do is weigh up whether or not defeating her now and buying ourselves a round of freedom is worth the potential pain it would cause us further down the line when we're a bit further through the threat deck. So uh, let's imperil ourselves. Let's do it. So I'm going to use the key of power for its play one additional action. 
and I'm going to use influence. Pop that to the bottom of the track. Push these up. So that's given us three influence, and again, I don't even need to spend the power token. It's just enough to defeat her, and she is off to the discard pile. And we are winning. If you look at our threat, uh, sorry, our spirit dial here, we're up to 19. So everything's hunky dory, and we can even still veil this fight action. So we'll veil that to get tilt. Sorry, veil. <laughs> uh, so we'll tilt that to get the uh, the power token there. And then reset everything because there's no threats here, there's nothing doing us any damage. So we'll reset all of this. And we'll go to a new round. Okay, so we now have these two keys down here. We've used them for their um, gain an additional action ability, but we can still flip them for their the key of power is gonna give us plus one fight. And the key of love is gonna give us plus one influence. And we've got two of the five keys that we need to open this portal and bring that into play. Okay, so we'll do one more round and then we'll have a look at these. Okay, so new round, we'll draw a new threat. We'll flip that over. And it's a healer. Okay, so this is giving us kind of a break here. The healer has the playing ability to gain one spirit. So we're now. Back up to 20. Okay, and then we're going to draw a, a memory. Which is memory of cold. Okay, and this allows us to ignore a spirit cost one threat this round. So she is doing one point of damage. So we could potentially play this to ignore her this round. Okay, we just have another question here, which is are the threats with the same name? all exactly the same or do they have different abilities needed to defeat them so for example we have multiple um, mystics here like this one and um, depending on the makeup of the vignette you'll get a different amount of threats in there so we've got we know we've got all four mystics in here <coughs> excuse me so um, but we've got three enforcers three fighters three goblins three healers so their stats, their actual abilities um, here will be the same, but their abilities, whether or not you need influence, fight, or explore, or a combination to overcome them, may and do vary from card to card. They also, through the first five campaigns, sorry, the first five vignettes of the campaign, um, each time you play a new vignette, you'll be basically effectively shuffling out uh, threats from the previous one and introducing new ones and as you introduce the new ones they get they get tougher and tougher as you go on and they all have different abilities every single threat in the game has an ability as well as its stats to overcome and um, with the base game uh, once you play through those five vignettes if you manage to defeat them all you can then expand the experience by playing through the absolution expansion. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, absolution expansion. The absolution expansion adds fifteen more vignettes to the game, and those start to escalate further and further. So the maximum number of the same type of threat you can have in the game is four. Uh, so as you can see here, you could have four pariahs, four mystics, four hobgoblins, and um, and once you get into the expansions, um, the expansion threats, the maximum number you can have of those is two because there are so many of them. So uh, you'll only have two copies of the Cutthroat, for example. Uh, and again, all of their abilities, their special abilities on the card, these new abilities here, are different. And they mess with you in different ways. So they might target your uh, power tokens. They might target your actions themselves. They might target your memories. As we've seen, the outcast can get shuffled into your deck. Uh, there are seraphs, uh, which you can do, which also get shuffled into your deck and actually give a benefit. Um, some of the deja, these spirits that you're trying to um, restore to their former glory or, or just give release, aren't necessarily, thematically, they're not necessarily out to kill you. Uh, the anima, which are the minions of this large thing here, are evil sort of demons and monsters and the goblin kingdom, things like that, that are out to, to like obliterate you. Uh, whereas this healer 
effectively her uh, presence in this world is caused by pain and suffering that she's gone through in her life and she might not necessarily be an evil spirit for example her ability here is she actually cures you when she comes into place she gains she gives you a spirit and if we look down here her damage each round is minus one so her presence there drains your essence but if you defeat her you actually gain a spirit as well so there are two opportunities to gain spirit from defeating the healers so some of them um, muck about with you in different ways and some of them can like a small number of them can be beneficial most of them will will try to screw you over in various different ways and as the game goes on you'll be refining your memory deck here so what you have at the end of each vignette you have the opportunity uh if you defeat that vignette to take out one of these cards so if you look we already came across an example i think of uh, let's pop that down. uh the memory of might here gives you a bonus of one might uh, but previously we've used a card which gives you a bonus of two might and so you what you here we go memory of blood gives you two bonus might so as you're refining your deck um it's not it's not strictly a deck building game it has these sort of deck construction elements what you'd probably want to do if you were going to expand your might ability is take this card out of your deck for example and bring in a new version of that which might give you plus one might and uh, restore one spirit or it could be plus three might or it could be uh, some of the abilities allow you to mess with the threats back so you might have uh, an upgraded memory further down the line where you can actually play a card to flip a threat back over like that and stick it back on the top of the deck or if it's particularly nasty um, you could even some of them you can flip over and put to the bottom of the, of the threat deck as well. So you can really um, muck about with the threat deck as much as it's trying to mess with you. Uh, and so yeah, all of them have unique abilities. And there are some that have multiplayer abilities as well. So if you're playing uh, cooperatively, there are cards which do, uh, I uploaded a playthrough myself and Francesca going through uh, the third vignette with uh, in a cooperative game. And we've chosen the upgrades that allow you to heal each other. You can also, if you're playing competitively, you can choose the same cards, but you can damage each other or steal cards from each other and, and mess about with each other that way as well. And there are various levels of upgrades as well. So there's three different, there's memory upgrade one, two, and three. And they're harder to get to. You have to trade in a, a higher cross, a, a higher upgrade memory to get to it. So if you want a memory, um, a, a level three memory upgrade. You'd have to trade in a level two memory upgrade to get it, kind of thing. Uh, and obviously, they they make you more powerful, but the vignettes are becoming more powerful as you go along as well. Um, where was I up to? Okay, I've kind of messed the, the play area up a bit here. But uh, what I'll talk you through is if we skip to if we imagine that we've obtained all five keys out of this deck here. So we're still playing through, um, the threats are coming out each round, our memories are coming out each round, we're growing our power, we're adding power tokens, we're uh, carefully manipulating the action power track to make sure that we're dealing with the threats, but also not abandoning one uh, statistic or the other, because if you fall behind and explore, you can guarantee something that needs explore is going to come out of the threat deck. Uh, but as we go along doing that, Let's pretend that we've got all five keys out of this threat deck, all either here, ready to be used, or even if they're all used and flipped over and all of our keys have been expended, we've used all the powers. But at uh, the point where we have five keys, this portal is going to come into play. And this is like one last challenge that we have to overcome. And the portal uh, comes into play when you've collected all five keys. And to defeat it, we use the vignettes explore value. The portal is going to drain your energy the whole time it's there. And to defeat it, each vignette has a value which you have to overcome. In this case, it's explore three because it's the first vignette. So that sounds nice and easy. You just got to make sure that your explorer is in the top slot here and ready to go as soon as the portal comes out. You can also only escape through the portal. You have to have collected the five keys. You also have to have defeated any foes listed on the vignette. So in this case, we would have to be the Goblin King before we can escape through the portal. 
And if you're able to do that, collect all the bad keys, defeat all the, the, uh, the foes, the bosses basically, uh, overcome the portal, and escape through the portal, then you win that vignette and you can move on to the next one. However, to get to that, the five keys are shuffled into five stacks and stacked atop each other to create this threat deck in the first place. So the fifth key is always going to be in the bottom six cards. And at that point, the timer really escalates. If you're able to get that key and defeat the boss and defeat the portal all within a couple of rounds, you're fine. All good. Brilliant. But the chances are the deck is going to run out as you're hurtling towards the, the portal. And, and even if you get that last key, you might not have the ability to, you know, you might not have the explore required to go through the portal. And so there's a good possibility that the threat deck is going to run out, basically. So when all the threat deck is completely um, discarded, and at the start of your round, you know, you've got a bunch of threats in play, uh, and you go to draw a threat, and there's none there, then you have to flip the entire threat deck over and shuffle it, but you also have to shuffle in the Archfiend. Okay, so you spent so long in this area of the Veil, the Archfiend knows you're there, and he's coming after you. Uh, and this representation of him gets shuffled into the threat deck, and as you can see here, if it's played, it's ability. <laughs> when played, you lose. Okay, so that's uh, your timer. Uh, this gets shuffled in here, and if you noticed, we had the outcast coming into our own deck here. Uh, there are um, certain cards which when you defeat them, they're removed from the game. So depending on which uh, vignette you're playing through, the threat deck is also doing what it can to get smaller and more efficient so that you're more likely to get around to the arch fiend faster. And if you do, of course, you know, it doesn't matter how many power tokens or how many memories you've got, how many keys you've got, or whether or not you're just about to get through the portal, the second you draw the Archfiend, you lose and it's game over. And that is the game in a nutshell. So the, the main sort of uh, points of development throughout the game are going to be the fact that you have this huge variety of threats that you're going to be facing throughout the game. All the different abilities, you're going to be honing your deck as you go through it, and if you are you know, you've played through and enjoyed the first five vignettes and you've managed to upgrade your Veil Wraith and, you know, you're steaming through and you think you've got a handle on the game, then uh, that's a really good moment to consider maybe investigating in, in, investigating, investing in the Absolution expansion, which then gives you 15 further vignettes to play through. Um, and, you know, you can keep that experience going. And if you are able to defeat all 20 vignettes and you're amazing and awesome, then you can tweak the experience, make it slightly more difficult, and start again. So, you know, providing you're, you know, you're enjoying the game as much as I do, you can, the, the actual experience, the amount of hours that you can devote to it, it's huge for what is ostensibly a game that you can play through, you know, 30 or 40 minutes, or 20 or 30 minutes, depending on how fast you are. Um, there is a, there's a mammoth amount of replayability built into the game. And I've definitely lost, like, in development of this, days at a time, you know, just going, oh, I'll just play through, I'll just see how far I get. And, you know, before you know it, it's, oh, it's two in the morning, I'll probably, I'll probably finish after this next one. Um, but it's been, it's been so much fun to design, and it, for me, it feels like it's really unique. I've not seen a game that looks like it on the market or uh, really plays like it. I was inspired by a few uh, solo games that I played that played in, like, 20 or 30 minutes and didn't really have the uh, sort of aesthetic or theme or sort of narrative that interests me as much, basically. Um, you know, there were brilliant games in the own right, but really didn't uh, uh, like capture my imagination in the same way. And so when designing a game, my point of view tends to be if, if, it, if, if it's something that doesn't already exist on the market, then I know I'm, I'm onto a good thing. Um, a couple of years back, I started designing uh, Special Forces men on a mission game which is like one of my favorite sort of movie genres and i got quite far down the line of development and then um dbg dan versus games released a game called warfighter 
uh, and it ticked all the boxes that I wanted. And I was like, okay, I can put this game to one side because this is the game that I wanted to play, that I wanted to design. Uh, but with Veil Raid, it really feels to me like there's there's nothing else like it. Um, I hope that doesn't sound too pretentious, but I think we've got another question here. One sec. Is there a card that can directly slow down or block adding keys to the portal? Is there a card that can slow down or block? So like a threat card that stops that from happening? Um, well, I wouldn't want to sort of spoil all the special abilities of the cards that are in the game up front. Uh, that sounds like a cool ability and a cool sort of idea, um, but I'm... I can't. I can neither confirm nor deny whether or not that ability exists in the game, um, but it is a great question. And yeah, so unless there are any other questions, I think I'm going to draw that to a halt because I've been blethering on with myself. And as soon as I start talking about other games and stuff, I realise it's probably not what I, <laughs> you guys have come here to uh, to get. So that's Veil Wraith, and um, there are playthrough videos on the Kickstarter page. And there's one, if you can stand my voice, there's another one of me playing through this scenario to its conclusion. There is also a cooperative playthrough video of myself and Francesca going through one of the vignettes, and Ricky Royal has done a, a much better playthrough than we could do uh, of a vignette as well. Um, we are really active in the comments. It's either myself or Francesca you'll be speaking to on our Facebook page, on the Twitter page, uh, and in the comments on Kickstarter. I want to thank all of the backers who who brought us this far. Like the success of the Kickstarter has been mind blowing. It's been it felt like a risk doing this game in a way because it's so unique and because of the black and white art and all that kind of stuff. And the fact that it's funded so successfully has just been this uh, validation. You know, this vote of confidence. And so I'm really really delighted with that. And I also received. The responses to our survey, which were basically um, questions, sort of generic questions designed to sort of ask you, you know, what things you liked about the, the, the game or the campaign, what you think we could do better, and, you know, all your feedback and stuff. And there were hundreds, hundreds of responses, and I just want to say I was absolutely overwhelmed, if not a bit choked up, by the unbelievable positivity of um, your responses, and it's... Francesco and I were just reading through them before we started this thing tonight and we're just blown away by the support. It's been absolutely incredible and it makes doing this really fun and it makes us realise that we're on the right path and um, you know we, we'll keep doing it for as long as you have us. So that's I think that's all for me. Um, does, sorry, one more question. Does the Kickstarter price include... Uh, shipping, no, the, the shipping will be calculated in the pledge manager um, once the campaign's finished. It will be kind of in line with what the shipping costs were for 1565 St Elmo's Pay, which is our previous campaign. Um, and the only reason we're not posted them is because we don't have the exact prices yet, but we are developing that and the pledge manager will be live within, hopefully within days after the campaign finishing. If you've got any concerns or questions about shipping, just PM me directly. Um, and I'll be happy to field your questions. Um, and it's past 11 o'clock here, so I'm going to go and relax now and try and squeeze in an episode of The Last Kingdom, which is the best TV show on the planet right now. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed watching and that you'll join us on the Kickstarter and maybe even throw in a pound just to see if it's the kind of thing you might be interested in and join the conversation, join the community. Um, or hang out with us on Facebook. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to Tabletopia for setting up this digital version for uh, to Mark Harris for holding my hand and setting up OBS and being able to stream this for you all. Uh, I'm going to sign off. Thanks a lot.